Colve Edie's marshes, or beware the Ides of March, was the admonition delivered to Rome's dictator, Gaius Julius Caesar, some time prior to the March 15th Senate meeting of 44 BC. Although this exact phrase was the creation of English playwright William Shakespeare, Suetonius tells us that an Etruscan horospex by the name of Spirina, while performing the state-sanctioned sacrifice of an ox, discovered the heart and liver to be missing from among the burned entrails. Concerned over such an ill omen, Spirina warned Caesar that his life was in grave danger as the days approached the Ides of March. But Caesar's whole life had been lived in the throes of grave danger. He had suffered prescription at the hands of the dictator Lucius Cornelius Sulla, had been kidnapped and held hostage by Cilician pirates, had faced possible death in mysterious Britannia and Germania across the Rhine, risked being poisoned in Egypt, and was supremely threatened had he lost any one of the civil war battles to the Pompeians. In the pre-dawn hours of the morning on the Ides of March, while sleeping off his overindulgence in the wine he had savoured at the home of Marcus Aemilius Lepidus, we are told by Plutarch that Caesar dreamt of soaring above the clouds like an eagle, but woke abruptly when the door and window of his bedroom burst open inexplicably. Next to him in bed, bathed in moonlight and mumbling broken words and inarticulate groans, Caesar's wife, Calpurnia, lay tossing and turning in the fits of her own dream before suddenly screaming herself awake. An irreligious woman who gave no credence to dreams and omens, Calpurnia had dreamt first that the pediment of their house had collapsed, then that she had wept over the murdered body of her husband. So affected by her dream was Calpurnia that she begged Caesar to cancel the Senate meeting, or at the very least to make sacrifices himself and read the entrails. Should no clean portents appear, indicating he must attend the Senate meeting, Calpurnia encouraged him to stay home for the rest of the day. Caesar agreed and dutifully went to offer a number of sacrifices in the Forum Romanum, which was just outside his home. While overseeing the sacrifices, Caesar caught sight of the Etruscan horospex Spirina. The Ides of March have come, announced the dictator. I, Caesar, replied Spirina, the Ides have come, but not yet gone. With the sacrificial entrails having produced no good omens, Caesar, who after a night of drinking with Lepidus and Decimus Brutus, was not feeling his best, decided to heed his wife's cautionary advice and stay home. He sent word to Marcus Antonius to cancel the Senate's meeting. Before long, Decimus Junius Brutus knocked on Caesar's door. After learning why Caesar intended to cancel the Senate meeting, Decimus Brutus laughed, dismissing Calpurnia's fears. The Senate was already assembled and awaiting Caesar's arrival. His friends and supporters have come with enthusiasm, Decimus Brutus explained, anxious to pass legislation honoring Caesar with the right to bear the title king while in the provinces. With his upcoming campaign against Parthia, such legislation would pave the way for Caesar to wear the diadem and fulfill the circulating hearsay that only a king of Rome could defeat the Parthians. How offended would the senators be if told to go back to their homes, only to return to the Senate one day when Calpurnia happens to have better dreams? If Caesar truly believed the day to be inauspicious and wished to put off all senatorial business until another day, encouraged Decimus Brutus, he ought at least go and explain his reasoning in person, which Caesar then agreed to do. As Decimus Brutus led Caesar through the streets, the two making their way towards the theatre of Pompeius, a man slipped Caesar a small scroll. This man urged Caesar to read the message immediately, and while alone, accustomed to being passed scrolls and petitions by people in the streets, Caesar simply tucked the scroll into the sinews of his toga. Outside the theatre of Pompeius, senators and conspirators alike mingled in small groups, talking amongst themselves as they awaited Caesar's arrival. As the senators swarmed Caesar, each hoping to speak with him, Decimus Brutus moved to join Publius Servilius Casca and Gaius Cassius Longinus, both fellow conspirators. As the three of them waited for the groups of senators to move inside the Curia, a senator named Papilius Lenas approached Publius Casca, speaking as though he was privy to information imparted to him by Marcus Junius Brutus. Believing their plot had been discovered, 
The three men panicked before they suddenly realized Lena's was only speaking about Kaska's candidacy for the Edaoship. However, another senator, while making conversation with Cassius and Decimus, urged in hushed tones that they not delay. People knew, and word was spreading. Stunned by this revelation, Cassius and Brutus watched nervously as Lena's then went to speak with Caesar, whispering in the dictator's ear. Marcus Junius Brutus, also mingling among the senators outside the Curia, noted this and signaled to Cassius and to Decimus Brutus that they were to take their own lives rather than be captured. But Lena's, having only petitioned Caesar regarding some personal matter, began casually moving with the crowd of senators as everyone made their way towards the Curia. Marcus Antonius, as he ambled along with a flock of senators, was stopped at the Curia door by Gaius Trebonius, who requested a private word. Inside the Curia, Caesar moved to take a seat in his gold and ivory chair, which had been set up next to the plinth which bore a statue of Pompeius Magnus. As senators began taking their seats, Lucius Tilius Simba, whose brother was in exile, approached Caesar. A Simba loudly petitioned Caesar to pardon his brother and permit him to come home, the other conspirators, with daggers hidden beneath their togas, slowly moved closer as if in support of Simba. When Caesar refused to pardon his brother, Lucius Tilius Simba grabbed Caesar and yanked his toga down off his shoulder. Caesar, whose person was legally inviolable, recoiled, shouting, this is violence. At that moment, Publius Servilius Casca, Caesar's friend since childhood, came up behind the dictator. With his dagger drawn and raised high, he struck. Caesar managed to deflect Casca's blow, but still received a slice on the shoulder. Casca, you villain, cried Caesar. Casca, shouting in Greek, then turned and urged his brother to help him. Titidius Servilius Casca rushed towards Caesar as his brother grappled with the dictator. Caesar managed to throw off Puppius Casca, but then turned to face Titidius Casca, who plunged his dagger deep into Caesar's ribs. A few more conspirators, who had been almost frozen in disbelief, suddenly came to life, rushing Caesar. In a frenzy of dagger blows, Cassius gashed Caesar across his face. Decimus Brutus's dagger found its way into Caesar's thigh. Cassius, wielding another blow, accidentally lacerated the hand of Marcus Junius Brutus as he executed a simultaneous jab with his dagger. Caesar, losing the struggle as he fought to resist his attackers for as long as humanly possible, collapsed to the ground. Marcus Junius Brutus, the son of the woman who had shared her bed with Caesar for more than twenty years, then dealt the final blow. With his hand bleeding profusely, Brutus punched his dagger firmly into Caesar's groin. Less than a minute after Publius Servilius Casca had yanked Caesar's toga off his shoulder, Caesar lay writhing on the floor, riddled with stab wounds and his blood flowing red. As Pompeius Magnus had done when betrayed to his death in Egypt, Caesar drew up his toga to cover his face, shrouding labored breathing and painful grunts. Lying on the floor at the feet of the statue of Pompeius Magnus, Rome's dictator in perpetuum, Gaius Julius Caesar expired. Gaius Julius Caesar was born into an ancient patrician clan who barely breached the wall defining Rome's top twenty most powerful families. He was born into a family so poor that his grandfather had been reduced to marrying his patrician daughter to a low-born military man. As a young boy, he was attached by both birth and marriage to the losing side of Rome's first civil war between the Marians and the Sullans. Yet he was a survivor of the dictator Sulla's bloody prescriptions and a winner of a military crown during his very first battle. As political heir to his uncle, third founder of Rome, Gaius Marius, he became leader of the Populares party. He entered the Roman priesthood as Flomen Diolis, then rose to the offices of Edile, Praetor, Propraetor, Consul, Proconsul, the office of censor, and triumphed as conqueror of Gaul. The first Roman to lead an army across the Rhine River, the first Roman to lead an invasion of Britannia, the first politician to successfully conclude the seven decades battle begun by Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus to redistribute public land to Rome's poor, the first Roman to be named dictator for life and imperator for life, the first Roman to be given the right to pass the priestly office of Pontifex Maximus to an heir, 
and the first patrician to ever hold the office of tribune of the plebs without first being adopted into a plebeian family, was now gone. The Senate, many of whom sat frozen in their seats as Caesar was brutally murdered before their eyes, began to shift uneasily as the rest of the conspirators, those who had not taken part in the killing, rushed forward and began stabbing Caesar's corpse with their own weapons. Marcus Junius Brutus, with his bloody dagger still in hand, turned to face the sitting senators. But before Brutus could speak, the senators, afraid they might be next on the assassin's list, bolted for the door. As they poured out and into the streets, word spread faster than wildfire. Caesar is dead. 